attended council hearings in person. You tuned in to our televised proceedings on Channel 13. Now, you have the chance to listen to us on the radio as we demystify the work of the people who do it. This is not a council hearing. This is You're in the Council with your host, Josh Gibson. Thank you, deep voice person with a funky backbeat. Indeed, this is not a council hearing. This is hearing the council. You can't have a government without a council, so you can't have a government radio station without a council show. This is it. I'm Josh Gibson, Director of Communications from the, for the Council. You may also know me as the Council's voice on social media at Council of DC. Um, we're back with a new episode of Hearing the Council after a break. And apparently during the uh, break, uh, Facebook Live and Zoom decided to not work together super well. So uh, this interview was being recorded, um, but as you'll already know by the time you hear this, it wasn't on Facebook Live, our apologies, but it'll still be broadcast on DC Radio and it will still go out as a podcast. Um, with that administration out of the way, um, thank you uh, for joining us, uh, Council Member Christina Henderson at large. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, um, this is our first time, uh, I think, talking um, since the election, so congratulations. Thank you. And um, so how's it going? Well, it's been a, a bit of a whirlwind. I think we are in month four. Um, and I, I, I like to joke with my colleague, um, Janice Lewis George, that we should get kind of medals because no one anticipates the first week of work will be during an insurrection. Um, and then we follow that with an uh, inauguration and we've been dealing with the COVID vaccine rollout. It's just, it has been nonstop um, ever since January. Yeah, now I, I hear that and I feel that. Um, well, uh, as most of our listeners know, generally our first interview with each council member <clears throat> is a bit of a biogra <clears throat> excuse me, biographical deep dive, a bit of a getting to know you kind of thing so folks can get a sense of where you come from and, and uh, what makes you tick. So I did a little uh, you know, research in publicly available uh, biographical information. Um, so we're just gonna kind of take a quick walk through your career and then all our future interviews will be about specific legislation and policies, but I think folks benefit from knowing a bit about their council members. Got it. Um, so initially I wanna start off, so it sounds like you were an army brat. You were someone who moved around a great deal in your youth. Talk to us a bit about that. It was your mom who was in the army. Yeah, my mom uh, joined the army when I was in third grade, maybe second grade. It was a long time ago. Anyway, um, you know, so I was born in New York. Um, and then, you know, from there, um, uh, things just started to take off and, and we started to move um, around. And um, uh we lived in lots of different places. So I like, I went to middle school in North Carolina. I went to high school in Georgia. Um, so it was just kind of a, you know, here and there everywhere, but I never went overseas. And how did that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how did that come about that, that after starting a family, your mom uh, entered the military? That doesn't seem like a normal, uh, uh, not normal, but like a, a kind of itinerary you normally hear about. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as with any, um, you know, young parent who is looking for a different career path and um, a different way, you know, for her, that was something that she wanted to take on and to do. Um, and she's always had a passion for service. And so, you know, serving our country is, you know, one of the ways that she did that. That's phenomenal. Now, a question that uh, my daughter had, uh, my daughter's 11, um, and she suggested <laughs> that I ask, and I think it's a good one is when you were in school growing up, what type were you? Were you the nerd, the brain, the jock, the class clown, the, you know, sort of uh, outcast? You know, what, what, what kind of stereotypical type were you or were you your own, your own thing? Um, so it's kind of a mix. I went to um, magnet schools, um, both in middle school and high school. So I think you're kind of a nerd by default in, the town um, where we lived, like by going to Columbus High School, people were like, oh, you're super smart. Um, but like within that, you know, obviously, like I took AP courses and those kinds of things, but I was really in the artsy crowd. Um, if that could be a, what you call it, a stereotype, if you will. But, you know, I was in chorus, I, I did marching band, 
Um, I play the violin and orchestra. Um, I did theater, um, you know, so it was kind of a mix, but I also was like a cheerleader as well. And so, you know, I did a little bit of everything, but, um, you know, the bulk of my friends who I still keep in contact with to today from high school, like we were the artsy kids. We were, um, you know, the creative type. And actually kind of merging the first two questions, it occurred to me that if you are an army brat and you're relocating all the time, I'm not saying you would have chosen to do this, but you technically could reinvent yourself because each new place you're landing and no one knows you. And you could go from being the nerd to the theater kid to the jock, you know. It does it allow for that. Um, it does. But, you know, actually, I think one of the like the best things um, in terms of being a military kid is just sort of the ability to you have to get to know people very well um, and very quickly. Right. Like I did not. I feel why. Well, you know, I'm not necessarily an introvert, but I didn't have the luxury of doing that because you come into a situation where, you know, you've had cl classmates who have been together for years, right? Oh, we went to kindergarten together and first grade and all this sort of stuff. And now you're sort of a new person having to find your group, find your way. Um, and you just have to figure out like, how do you meet new people? How do you talk to them? And I don't, I don't have the luxury of four years of history with you. So how can we connect very quickly? Yeah, I can imagine that comes in handy these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so after uh, primary school, you went off to Furman University and mm -hmm. uh, folks may know uh, that you were the first black student body president, I believe. I was, um, yes. Um, but what they might not know about, and looking back into the arts piece, is that you were with the pauper players. Oh, wow. You really <laughs> did. <laughs> you really did dig into the archives. <laughs> hey, it was on your LinkedIn page. It's it's <laughs> their game, okay? Yeah. Um, so the pauper players, um, it was sort of, a, again, you know, it was an independent theater group that um, put on productions and, and shows, mainly me musicals. Um, and so when I was a freshman, I was in ragtime with popper players, um, which was like an incredible experience and to be able to do that. And um, later, I wanna say when I was a junior maybe, um, I was able to be a director for a smaller production um, that focused around African-American history and culture and arts. And it was a celebration of that. So, you know, I, I was able to keep one foot in sort of the arts and creative space, even, um, in college. Yeah. I, I did theater in high school. And one of the cool things about theater and it, it's not, there aren't a lot of other extracurriculars like that is it really brings together an odd mix of people. Oh yeah. Oh you yeah. Have dance folks and you have the folks doing lights uh, you know, direction, the band. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like kind of its own little universe. You know, I don't, I don't, on the football team, you have folks who want to play football, but in theater, it's such a cross-cutting group of people. I, I find it's. Yeah, it was a cross-cutting group. And I think too, doing that production as a freshman, you just get to know a lot more people. I got to know a lot of upperclassmen, um, you know, through that experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, and apparently the mascot at Furman is the paladin. Yes. This, this ends the bizarre ancient history part of the interview. But uh, uh, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. For viewers, that is a fancy word for a knight. <laughs> a knight, but with a, a knight with like a religious flavor, a bit of a religious flavor. I think. Yeah, I mean, Furman used to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, yeah. So, you know, when I mentioned that to folks and the idea that I was the first person who was elected student body president, you know, in 2007, at that point, Furman had been around for 183 years, 182 years. Um, you know, there's, there's race that definitely plays a role. There was a long time where Furman was an all white institution as many predominantly white institutions, private institutions um, started in that regard. And so, um, yeah, when they broke away from the Southern Baptist Convention, it was a very controversial move, but it was one that frankly, 
Um, I'm not sure I would have found Furman if they had still been a part of um, the SBC, um, just sort of given how schools in the SBC normally are in terms of accepting, you know, students of um, different backgrounds and, and thoughts and viewpoints. Um, it was a great liberal arts education. And uh, just a, a quick uh, trivia point um, to folks who hear the word paladin, if you are a Dungeons and Dragons nerd, you will also recognize the word paladin. I was a Dungeons and Dragons. Imagine theater nerd, Dungeons and Dragons nerd. <laughs> I see a bit of a, a trend appearing. Um, so anyway, let's fast forward to more recent history. And you are part of an elite group of council members who are former staff members. Yes. Uh, so what uh, what do you think you bring to the table as a council member having previously been a council staff? Um, well, I think it's a lot. So first, um, you know, for me, I'm not starting from scratch in terms of understanding one, our agency structure, but then two, how sort of the council works from, you know, hearings, markups, right? Um, that wasn't necessarily new to me. Um, I think it also brings an understanding um, of the work and what it means to do it and do it well. Um, I was a committee director for two years. So I know what the performance oversight process looks like from a staffer perspective. Um, I know what it looks like to have to put actually put the budget together from a staffer perspective, from a committee perspective and, and doing that work. And I think that, um, you know, it, uh, it affords me the ability to ask the different types of questions. I, I hate asking surface questions because I feel like there's so much more. And I think that, you know, when you're a staffer, you have the, you, not the ability, but like you have the time as well as the responsibility to sort of get in deep on some of the issues. And um, I think that will carry over for me as a council member, or at least I hope it will. Right. Have you already had a moment where you had uh, the, like when I'm running this thing, I'm gonna do things differently. Have, have <laughs> you already had a moment where you've been able to implement one of those? Like, I'm not gonna do ask the blah, 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 silly question, or I'm going to do the improved version of whatever. Did you have something come to mind for that? Well, I mean, that's how it was sort of my approach for performance oversight. I think as a staffer, sometimes you get so, um, you know, the hearings can be long, all of the different types of things. And um, you also recognize too, and sometimes agency directors might be filibustering you or not giving you a sort of direct answer. And I've been able to curtail that a little bit. But also I found too that agency directors, the good ones anyway, who are really trying to be savvy at this, right? Like they will like, well, let me give you a little bit of a history. So it takes up more of your time to, you know, answer or ask questions. And I have stopped some people before. I'm like, hey guys, you know, I used to work here or like, not only that I used to work here, but I also used to work for your particular agency. So I don't need the history. Let's just get into the meat. <laughs> Which kind of thwarts their plans. But um, I, I do find that to be a, like a, a little, you know, trump card that I have that I can always pull when I feel like, um, you know, you're like, well, let's go back to the beginning. Well, actually I was here for the beginning. So we don't need to go back to the beginning. Just like, let's go back to like the last couple of years here um, and then go forward from there. I also wonder how much is, you know, when I was a kid and I was saying, as a parent, I am never gonna do that thing where you lick your finger and you take the dirt off your kid's face. And then yeah. you and end then up I as a parent that. and you're like, I don't know what else to do. Like, so I'm wondering I if have a water source and you look like a crazy person. Yeah, no, I, I've done that. Sit back as a staffer and be like, oh, if I was a council member, this is what I would do X, Y, and Z. And then you get in the spot and you're like, oh, now I get why they do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I mean, I think that like, it is always easier in some ways to be behind the scenes because at the end of the day, your name is not on the vote. And I do recall sometimes when I was a staffer, not just for the council, but even when I was working in the Senate, feeling a level of frustration around how a certain member might have voted on a particular issue. And being a council member now, um, and not just you know 
and in particular being an at-large member, which I think is a little bit different than being a ward member in terms of the things that you have to contemplate and sort of the various perspectives that you have to kind of bring to the table. Um, every vote is not easy. There are some votes that are highly complicated um, and not from a political perspective, but also from just a like, okay, what does this mean in the long term? What does this mean for the good of the whole city not just in this like particular moment. Um, and yeah, I think for, for a little bit of that now, I kind of feel like I, I want to give some elected officials grace. I say some, because some of them are, are not worthy. <laughs> it, it, sort of on the national level, in terms of the decision-making that they're making. Um, but there's just so much to consider. There's so many pieces and you know, I, I think that's one in terms of like how folks vote, but also to, you know, when you're a staffer, you, I focus on a couple of issues, right? When I was committee director for the Committee on Education, my focus was on the education agencies and public libraries. So I could very, you know, narrowly focus. And now as a council member, people are expecting you to not just know about, you know, the issue that you have a background in, which for me would be education and workforce, but they, they want you to be familiar with the stop sign situation on their corner or you know the development issue in their ward or their neighborhood or the particular you know backstory about some particular alley in their community and frankly it's just a lot of information that you just kind of have to keep in your head all at once um you know sometimes I'm envious of my ward colleagues and they're like you only have to focus on your ward I have to literally know everything about the whole city um because you never know when you're going to meet someone and that's their like you know they want you to feel they want to feel like you have been paying attention to the particular issue that their neighborhood and community has been facing um regardless of the fact that every neighborhood and community wants the exact same thing <laughs> Right. I mean, in terms of the complexity of issues uh, at the most recent uh, legislative meeting, we had to vote on whether to uh, use eminent domain to seize a plot of land mm -hmm, mm -hmm. slated to be a halfway house to make it a park. And I was just amazed. That just seems like such a perfect example, because in that vote, as your council member deciding it, you're you're expressing your views on how returning citizens should be treated. Mm -hmm. uh, you're expressing your views on how eminent domain should be used, the need for urban parks, the if 300 beds is too big for a shelter, if the subcontractor that's providing the shelter uh, is a good subcontractor, uh, how the Bureau of Pr Prisons treats DC since we're not a state, yeah. um, how the citizens of Ward 7 are going to feel, how the businesses of Ward 7 are going to feel, you're uh, in relation with the Ward 7 council member. It, you know, it, it, I'm on social media. I there's good and bad in social media, but that one vote will get, you'll get tagged as pro halfway house or anti halfway house. There's so much complexity in that one vote and every vote you take, you need to bring that level of depth to your analysis. And I think folks don't necessarily get that. Yeah, and I mean, I think what you brought up is, is a really good point to underscore too, right, Josh? Like, I feel like in some cases, some situations, um, you know, residents, constituents, the public, they have maybe, I would say, uh, a quarter of the amount of facts about a situation than what we have, right? <laughs> so you think it's easy based on the four things that you know about in terms of this particular issue versus as you named, like, there is actually a hundred various things that have to sort of go into account there. Um, and, you know, I also think about history a lot. I think about legacy a lot. I think about what, um, you know, I guess going back to your earlier question, like I was the kind of nerd and I think that that has kind of continued in terms of wanting to be a lifelong learner but also feeling, you know, because I'm not a DC native, um, I have felt a responsibility since the day I moved to the city to learn more about the history um, of DC. And it's complex, right? It, it, it's complex in its relationship to the federal government. Um, and some of the things that happened in the district back in the day are heartbreaking and then you have to remind yourself, okay, <laughs> 
we weren't electing our own government then, right? We had Congress people from Indiana and Oklahoma and Kansas who were making you know, decisions on behalf of the district and therefore had a complete disregard um, you know, for the history and for the people who were here at the time. And you want to ensure, or at least I want to ensure that the choices that I am making is not recreating some of that history. Um, that we are trying to move in a, in a better light. Um, also recognizing that decisions that we make impact generations in some cases. Um, that vote um, about the eminent domain in, in Ward 7 Park, I think is gonna be one of those examples of it, it wasn't just an impact for a day. Um, so yeah. Um, and so, uh, so Council Member Grasso, so um, are you still in touch with Council Member Grasso? Well, not in the way that I would have been before, you know, ethics rules, <laughs> <laughs> because he's lobbying. Um, we, 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 we have a clean break because I don't want anyone, you know, saying, you know, he called me and even though we were out to, or we were talking about something else that we brought up some particular council business. I don't even want that. So. I will talk to him next year. <laughs> yes, that is that is deeply smart. Um, and uh, so you, uh, in addition to your time with the council, uh, you did have a roughly equal amount of time, I think time-wise, uh, with the Senate mm -hmm. um, well, working. Uh, if, am I roughly right? Well, so I, my time in the Senate was like my second tour of duty. So I had right. spent time working for Senator K. Hagan from North Carolina when I grew up. Oh yeah, I'm leaving that out. Gotcha. But yeah, my so, second tour of duty, yes, it was four years. Gotcha. Uh, with Chuck Schumer, who is never in the news, so low key, low profile member of Congress. Nobody knows him. <laughs> no, no. Um, how was that transition going from a body that we constantly yell at and don't have representation in to being part of that body? Um. um, you know, it's, uh, because I had been in federal government before, it wasn't like a crazy transition. Um, although there, there were definitely some adjustments. So for instance, um, you know, also working in leadership, which is completely different. Um, you know, Senator Schumer doesn't sit on any committees as sort of a regular member. Um, so hearings are not a thing that we are okay we got to prepare you for this hearing and do all these questions and xyz like that's not something that we do mm -hmm. um but also in a leadership role a lot of our work was around how do we take care of our members how do we ensure that our members are able to be successful legislatively and how do we craft um you know the messaging for the caucus what senate democrats are going to talk about on in terms of you know these particular issues etc um but, you know, there were definitely, look, it was the Trump years, right? <laughs> Being in the Senate in the minority during the Trump years brings its own level of frustration um, because you're dealing with a White House that uh, in some ways doesn't believe in government and yet they're running it. Right. Or they don't know how it works and yet they're running it. So it, a lot of frustration and a lot of frustrating pieces, but um, you know, we got to do some pretty cool stuff um, that actually surprised me that we actually got it done. Um, but, you know, really exciting time. And do you have, even in the back of your head, any regrets that now that Schumer's in the majority and is able to uh, accomplish many, but not all the things he wants to, that you're over here on the, the local side? Not at all. Not at all. I feel like, um, you know, we got I, um, one of the big things that happened even pre-pandemic that we were able to get done that I was able to convince <laughs> um, the, the Senator uh, to be for is we got the largest increase in the child care development block grant in history, right? Well, that was pre-pandemic, but at that time it was uh, almost more than double um, what the current funding was. And um, that felt really good Right, it felt like we moved in the right direction. And frankly, that investment that we had, um, I think enabled 
our childcare sector to not completely fall apart during the pandemic because we had already made this historic investment. And I kind of view it as like you were planting little seeds that now you get to see grow. Right. So we were planting seeds in terms of childcare, which is now sort of taken off. Uh, I was able to work on paid family leave policies specifically, um, you know, ideally it would have been for all workers, but we were able to get 12 weeks of uh, paid family leave done for all federal employees to get something like that done um, during, you know, the Trump administration, or even just during like McConnell being leader where there wasn't a lot of legislation happening. That was great. And now to hear my colleagues talking about, and we're going to continue to push for all workers. Um, I, I did a lot of work on higher education and student loans, student loan debt. Um, worked a lot with my colleagues um, in Senator Murray's office and Senator Warren's office to get the caucus together on, you know, the idea around canceling um, up to $50,000 of student loan debt. And frankly, when I turn on the news and I see, you know, Chuck and Senator Warren still talking about it, I feel good because like that means that the work that I did didn't just go, uh, you know, be shoved in a drawer. Now you're a majority leader, all the work that we laid, all the foundation that we laid, you can go ahead and go do that stuff now. And so I, I feel like I'm still a part of it, even though I'm not there for the day to day. Gotcha. And then you're also implementing whatever does happen, you know, hopefully positive things moving forward, whatever does happen, you'll be part of making them real right. on the local level. Right. Now, do you, do you feel that Chuck Schumer is Mitch McConnell's match in terms of procedural mastery and by any means necessary accomplishment of his goals? <laughs> The difference is not, I think, like Chuck versus Mitch. What, what I view as McConnell's power was that he had a caucus that was willing to say yes, no matter what, without question, 100% of the time. Ish, right? What we have on the Senate Democrat side, everybody, first of all, is not ideologically aligned. Right, so like if you think about like Senate Republicans, okay, Lindsey Graham and Rob Portman, yeah, yeah they, you squint a little, they're about the same as like a Rand Paul on some issues, right? In terms of votes, in terms of policy, they are equally to say no on most things. <laughs> when you look at the Democrats on the other side though, you gotta, you gotta manage a Joe Manchin to a Bernie Sanders. It is much harder for us to get the entire caucus to say yes or no 100% of the time. And I think that is the key difference between the type of quote unquote power that McConnell versus Schumer wield. Um, frankly, I would say Mitch has it easier because he has a caucus who's willing to just go along to get along. We have it harder because we have a caucus who is willing to ask questions, um, but also wants to remain authentic to their voice as opposed to being fake and saying like, I'm with something when I'm not. Does that make things harder? Yeah, but does it make government better? Because multiple viewpoints have a seat at the table, whereas before that was not the case. Sure. Yeah, and it seems like with the reconciliation stuff that's been in the news, like they are working the rules every last way they can. To oh, yeah, them. I was, when I saw the headline about the parliamentarian ruling on the reconciliation trial, I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. things have changed. You know, I, I thought that the parliamentarian would say no um, to that. I, look, I think there is going to have to be some type of come to Jesus conversation um, because the idea that one senator could hold up voting rights for the entire country. Um, do you want to be that person in history? That's like really the question I would ask Joe Manchin. Do you want to be that person um, who was so committed to a rule to give to protect the voice of a minority in the Senate that you don't want to protect the voice of the minorities in the country. I wouldn't want to live with that type of legacy, but frankly, I think that's the type of conversation that they're going to have to have with him on this. Yeah. <laughs> and Kristen Cinema, for that matter. 
Um, now, I want to throw out, we're starting to run a little short on time. I'm oh. throwing out a couple combo questions. Okay. One is uh, compare uh, David Grasso to Chuck Schumer as a boss. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I want you to throw in any little fun details we wouldn't know about Schumer or Grasso that you happen to know. Like, okay. oh, they love combos, or man, they can't get enough Grand Funk Railroad, or like. Yeah. Um, oh some my trivia God. and some boss comparison. Okay, so boss comparisons, they're very different. But I also think it was because of like the size of the office, right? So a council office, you have maybe six or seven people who are working, but if you add the committee staff, it's, it's a little bit more. The Schumer operation is more than 100 people deep. And that's including all of the various offices in state, et cetera. Um, so, you know, Chuck was one that like, when you, <laughs> when we take recess, we take recess. David was more or less like, yes, it's recess hours, but you're still gonna be here nine to five thirty. <laughs> like it was a normal day, um, which I think is just a, a function of the differences in terms of um, government types of things. Um, let's see, Senator Schumer has a sweet tooth, but I think people kind of know that. Um, and I don't think, Grasso had one in terms of like a sweet tooth, if you will. Uh, Grasso is definitely more outdoorsy, willing to go off-roading, camping, et cetera. That is not a Schumer. But he grew up on a farm, so that, you know. <laughs> Excuse me, I mean, yeah, Chuck is from Brooklyn. Um, so, uh, you know, camping and that kind of stuff. I, it's just not really in his, uh, his yeah, his, not in his wheelhouse. It's not in his wheelhouse, but um, you know, I think they both have a similar passion, though, for for the work and, and for public um, good and, and public safety, and you know, it's just a different type of someone who's been a legislator for thirty plus years versus someone who was a legislator for eight. Um, you know, they just have different perspectives on that they're bringing to the work. Uh, now to get us up to your current point, we, you know, we talked about your stint with David Grasso, your stint with Chuck Schumer. Let's talk about that crazy election that yeah. you came through <laughs> with uh, that number of candidates, a uh, virtual election. Uh, what what do you think you learned from that election? How, how did it make you a better council member? Um, well, there's so much. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think for listeners, first off, great. Um, you know, I announced that I was running in November of 2019. So this was pre pandemic. So my expectation and anticipation of what the election would look like was very different than what it turned out. Um, we had to sort of change course midway through things. I think when things first shut down in March, like many people, we thought, okay, it'll be a couple of weeks and then we'll get back to it. And then a couple of weeks turned into a month. And then a month turned into two months. And then, you know, the council had to change some rules around, you know, how we're going to do some things in terms of the election, just to make it accessible to people in the middle of a pandemic. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, running against 23 other people definitely taught me is that you need to be clear and concise in terms of your messaging. Because when we would do forums, right, like, you get 60 seconds to answer a question. You don't get three to five minutes to explain your position on things. So you have to like whittle it down. It has to be tight and you have to like get to your point across or enough of your point across so that people might be interested in wanting to go to your website and read more or come to a town hall that you're just doing with yourself and learn more to be able to ask questions, that kind of stuff. Um, but also too, I realized that um, there are lots of DC residents who still like a personal touch, but not too close of a personal touch, right? So we didn't do traditional canvassing because I felt uncomfortable in creating a space that would make it one safe for both the volunteer, but also for for the resident. And I also was just trying to think of like, you know, when we think about where we were a year ago, um, people were like, I'm wearing gloves, I'm wearing masks, I don't want to like have any unnecessary contact with someone I don't need to have contact with. So the idea of somebody like 
randomly coming up to your door and it wasn't with the Amazon package to like knock and have a conversation. Like, I felt like that was just going to go completely poor, <laughs> poorly. Um, but we did uh, basically contactless canvassing, which was like a lit drops. So we, you know, we had door hangers and volunteers would literally like go to the door, we'd leave the hanger and then go. And I've heard from so many people that they appreciated that type of effort and touch where it wasn't just mail, but like you literally came, you came to my door and you left something here for me and you know, that kind of stuff. So like, um, that's something to sort of keep in mind too. I Look, I don't know how elections are gonna be in the future. Um, obviously, I, I don't anticipate that there will be as many candidates that ran, um, but there are definitely some changes that will happen. Um, I think some organizations actually liked the Zoom meeting effect because um, more people in the community could participate. Um, and it didn't require like, oh, I have to book a space and I have to make sure we have a mic and I have to do all of these other things, right? It literally was like, do you have a laptop? Do you have an internet connection? Like, can you get on? Um, and frankly, as a candidate, it meant that I could do multiple things in one night because I didn't have to drive all over the city. Right. <laughs> I literally was like, okay, off one two, let me click on to the next one. You know, I could get, a, I, I was able to hit a lot more ground um in that way but it was a it was a crazy experience now one more thing on the elections talk to me about the post endorsement but I, I, talk to me about the logistics of the post endorsement like how does that how many people do you interview with what questions do they ask you how long does it take how long before after you do the interview do you find out um, I want to know the like behind the scenes of the post. Well, so this was the, you know, I was a first time candidate. So frankly, I didn't know much about the process. I could ask other people in terms of like, okay, is this about the time that it happens? Um, you know, what should I be doing and sort of the advance of these types of things? Because, you know, I think most people who keep up with DC politics know that like the post editorial board at, as it pertains to political endorsements has um, a track record and a particular history. But for me with 23 other candidates and being a first time candidate and also taking into account too that every registered voter in the district was going to get a ballot, right? That changes literally everything about how you think about who is your quote unquote audience and who is your quote unquote voter. Um, I needed the post endorsement more than anybody else probably, just in terms of like exposure and that stamp of validation that I wasn't getting from, um, you know, some of the community organizations who had already picked their candidate um, sort of in mass, if you will. Um, so I think there was like, there was a call to schedule. It was like a invitation call, like we like to, interview you um and then there was the interview <laughs> um and then, i mean it's like a you know 45 minutes to an hour conversation um on a variety of things right tell me your background tell me your you know why you're running um and then you know questions on particular issues that pop up etc and then that's it and then you don't know <laughs> There is no follow-up conversation. There is no other pieces. Um, and I had no idea when it was coming, to be frank. Um, I uh, was, it was up one morning. Um, we were about to go out and do a lit drop um, in Shepherd Park in Ward 4, which is not far from my house. And I was feeding my daughter um, breakfast. Um, we're just like getting ready for the day. And um, a friend texted on a group chat and was like, uh, are we not going to talk about this? And I was like, what are we talking about? And she dropped the link in the chat. And the first thing I saw was my picture. <laughs> and I was like, what was going on? Um, and, and that's how I found out. Um, and my husband has like some footage um, and slash photographs, like 
my hair wasn't done. I literally, it was like me and my kid and we're eating breakfast in the morning and I'm like, we're sitting, you know, to get ready for the day. Um, and you have this sort of bombshell thing that kind of hits. And um, yeah, I won't and get what, into the- What was the gap between the interview and getting that group text? Like weeks uh, or days? Or? No, it was, it, was a, it was a few weeks. It was a gotcha. few weeks. Um, and, and frankly, I, you know, I, I don't or didn't know or how many people the Post was talking to. So, you know, there's 24 people on the ballot. I don't know. I had to guess that they probably weren't gonna talk to everybody, but like, I didn't know how many. So I just was like, okay, I did my part. I did as best I thought I could do. And then like, I just need to focus in on the race. Cause if it doesn't happen, I still have to have like an action plan here um, in, in terms of, you know, getting my name out there and, and kind of doing the work, um, if you will. And, you know, the significant piece about the picture was because- Oh yeah. Earlier <laughs> in the campaign, the Post had done a story about what they considered to be sort of the top tier candidates. And I was interviewed for that story. Um, I saw the online version and thought it was, you know, fine, whatever. And then I started getting calls from people the next day who were like, oh my God, have you seen the Post? And I was like, yeah, I saw it last night. It's fine. They're like, no, have you seen the print version? Um, and for your listeners, um, I was the only female candidate who was in that featured in that story. Um, but in the print version of the article, I was the only one whose picture they did not print. Um, they only printed a picture of the men and that became its own thing. So for them to put my picture up there, it was kind of like a, okay guys, I see what you're trying to do. <laughs> well, yeah, well, cause they eventually ran a correction, you know, on like B13 at the bottom of the page where they did include your picture. Yeah, but well, it, it was, was an op-ed that someone had actually submitted, um, yeah. basically calling them out on it. And, you know, so it was like a whole thing, but um, that was a yeah. great day. It was rainy, but it was like, it was a great day. And did you come out of the interview thinking you had a decent, or you'd improved your chances, or you had a very good shot, or were you totally had no clue where they were coming out of the interview? I honestly had no clue. Because, you know, even though there were two seats available, I didn't know how many people that they would choose to endorse, if they would choose to endorse anyone, right? I mean, I think I've been in politics enough and have watched um, how this happens enough, right? A, a local paper could pull a curveball and say, we're not going to do anybody. Or, um, you know, earlier that year with, um, oh God, who was it? The New York Times for the national, for the presidential. Um, they pulled a curveball as opposed to just endorsing one person, one Democratic candidate, they, they endorsed two. So like, it could have gone either way. I felt com comfortable in that I was myself. I answered the questions, I presented a case as to why I thought I would be a great council member of all, a better council member than, you know, the folks who were running and why I felt like I, I deserved the opportunity to prove that. Um, but there was no feeling of like, oh yeah, I, I got this. No, not at all. <laughs> I didn't feel that way throughout this entire election, frankly. And um, even on election night, that was like a, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I had no inclination in terms of going in. I knew that I could kind of be there, but my biggest thing, and I would tell like my friends, like I just don't wanna embarrass myself. <laughs> I don't wanna get like 250 votes. And if we can exceed that, I'm going to call that like a win. Or right. Something. I don't know. <laughs> and I mean, so many council members have to run and lose at least once before they make it over the hump. So you know, I just like lowered expectations. Pressure. I just was like, okay, we'll see what happens. And frankly, I was actually kind of glad um, that at that point, like we couldn't do any parties in person. So like you can only sort of do things virtually, but I was like, great, because if it doesn't, if election night turns out horribly, not just for myself or for the presidency and for the whole nine, I could just like go to bed and nobody know. <laughs> As opposed to if you're in person at a party and you still have to like talk to guests and act cheerful. I didn't want any of that. So, you know, thank you pandemic for that one little <laughs> yeah, you, you need that silver lining sometimes. Yeah. 
Uh, well, we are out of time. We're going to do our one last question that we always do in the first round. I have to get my prop out. Oh. Um, you learn a lot by people uh, about people by having them rank dessert categories. That's what I've learned <laughs> in life. So I've asked every council member uh, I've ever interviewed for the show, so all of them, okay. um, uh, to rank these desserts. There we go. Oh, okay. Cake, candy, cookies, ice cream, and pie. So I want you to rank those from top to bottom, one to five, your favorite to your least favorite. Okay, ice cream is number one. I'm ice cream fiend. Mm. Um, candy would probably have to be number two. Oh, that's so bad. I hope my dentist is not listening. Um, <laughs> um, then cookies, then cake, then pie. We are dessert twins. Oh, good. Okay, good. You, you have, you have, I have to check the list. Did any of my colleagues say like pie first? Cause then I have questions. <laughs> well, the funny thing is the two who say pie first and you're going to laugh, the chairman and Alyssa Silverman. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. and, so and the chairman, funny. it's worse. And I always bring this up. Not just pie, rhubarb pie. Yeah. So he's disqualified from any votes on dessert at council. Uh, you know, this is get actually really good for us to know because if we ever in life have a council potluck, never, the chairman will never be allowed to sign up for dessert because he will bring a rhubarb pie and it will sit there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I just checked and I do have a spreadsheet. I just checked my spreadsheet and you are unique among council members. Am I? You and I are, are, are dessert twins, but there's no other, so you can't build a coalition around people that have your same dessert profile. Okay. You gotta start okay, from that's fine. Sometimes you gotta stand out and be an individual and it's I'm willing true. to, um, you know, back up my claims very mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. I feel you can, very strongly you about the way I rank those. Yeah, you, you, can, you can build a coalition. Ice cream first is Anita Bonds, Brianna Doe, Brooke Pinto, Vince Gray, uh, and Trayon White. Okay, good. So that could be the ice cream coalition. You need to get them uh, around a table once things are back to normal. Yeah, I, I think I, 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 there were times where I thought perhaps I was the only person who was like buying ice cream in the dead of winter, but there is ice cream in my house literally year round. Yeah. Usually, flavors. Trayon so. White's answer to the question was my favorite in that he said he, and this is when we were still at the radio station, he had three of them in his car at the moment <laughs> <laughs> of the interview. <laughs> that, that, that won me over a big time. I mean, like, I can't that do that, but like the freezer is right here, but you know, yeah. that, it's okay. Yeah. That's true. Um, well, sadly, we are out of time. Uh, thank you for your patience with the technical difficulties earlier. Thank you for uh, putting the time aside for the interview. Um, and I just want to uh, remind our listeners to subscribe to our podcast, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen, search for Hearing the Council. Um, thanks again for joining us. Tune in next time. We're on DC Radio 96.3 FM HD4 or dcradio.gov. And as always, I'm Josh Gibson, and this is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council. Thanks very much, council member. Appreciate it. Thank you for See having you me. See you eventually. <laughs> Bye.